History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 416th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to jump across the pond to a castle. We love our haunted castles. Yes, we do. This one is St. Brival's and it's in, hopefully I say it right, Gloucestershire, England. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the spectacular crew, Denise, Courtney, Mary Lou, Leslie, and Dawn. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Noddy. The moment in oddity was suggested by Tammy Burroughs. In August of 1953, a homeowner discovered a cobra in her yard in Springfield, Missouri. We can imagine they were pretty shocked because cobras are not naturally found in Missouri. The homeowner used a garden hoe to kill the creature. This wouldn't be too alarming if it was a one-time thing. But the following week, another cobra was found in a yard across the street. This time, the police were called and they visited a local pet store to see if they were missing snakes. They said no, but someone was letting snakes go because week after week, snakes showed up in yards. There were at least 11 of them that were killed or captured between August and October. For years, people believed that the pet shop owner was responsible, but he maintained his innocence until the day he died. Then, in 1988, a man named Carl Barnett confessed to the Springfield News leader, I'm the one that done it. He had stolen a crate of snakes from the pet shop when he was 14 and released them. He said of the incident, I realized what I'd done and I was scared to death. Every time someone mentioned the cobras, I just wilted. The Great Escaped Snake Scare of 1953 certainly was odd. Grab your slippers, hot chocolate, flashlight, and maybe even that baseball bat. And now, This Month in History. month of December on the 19th in 1917, the National Hockey League opened its first season. There had been the National Hockey Association before that time, which started in 1909. Major disputes had forced the association to shut down operations. Hockey was relaunched as the NHL with four teams, all from Canada. Those teams were the Montreal Canadiens, the Montreal Wanderers, the original Ottawa Senators, and the Toronto Arenas. The Wanderers and Arenas played the very first game under the NHL, with the Wanderers winning 10-9. Fifteen minutes later, the Senators and Canadians began their game with the Canadians winning 7-4. And I'm sure they say it like something like Canadians. I, I, I can't say it with a Canadian accent, so please forgive me, Canadians. So the Montreal teams won the first two NHL games played. Only three teams made it all the way to the end of the season. The fourth had their arena burned down. There was another league called Pacific Coast Hockey Association at this time, and the champions of each league played in the Stanley Cup Finals. This makes the NHL over 100 years old. St. Brival's Castle dates back to 1075 and is located in Gloucestershire, England. This isn't one of those grand and beautiful castles that Britain is known for, but it has an important place in history, serving as a hunting lodge for King John and a debtor's prison. 
Today, it's a youth hostel, and this castle is believed to be one of the most haunted castles in Britain. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of St. Brival's Castle. The Forest of Dean is a geographic and cultural region in western Gloucestershire bounded by the rivers Wye and Severn. This is one of the few surviving woodlands in Britain. Origin of the name is unknown, with some historians claiming that it's Welsh, and others that it represents a term meaning Land of the Danes after Vikings came into the area. It was on the western edge of the Forest of Dean that St. Brival's Castle was built. There was already a small village here before the castle was erected. It was a strategic position above the River Wye. Local limestone and red sandstone were used in the construction, which began in 1075. The castle was completed in 1129 and is a typical moated Norman castle that was fed water from a spring underneath a moat. The castle keep was a square Norman design erected on a mot of stone and clay and was originally wood. As listeners know by now, this design was for defense, putting a castle above the area where people would live. The bailey area was surrounded by a stone curtain wall. And I don't know if you remember what these look like, Kelly, but you basically have the mots up on a hill and then the bailey is in a valley there and they build a fence all the way around it. So it's called a mott and bailey design. Many early elements no longer exist, but historians believe that there was a forge building, a gateway on a south wall and a small round tower on the southeast corner. The original hall and solar two-story building still stands, as does a chapel built in the 14th century. The gatehouse is massive, flanked by two D-shaped towers and protected by three sets of portcullises, which are basically sliding gates. Those gates are usually latticed grill and made of wood or metal. There was a drawbridge at this gate as well. So I think you can envision what these are when we watch shows where you see these iron gates that come down that are latticed like that. It's that's yes, indeed. what this is. I just didn't know it had a technical name other than, you know, gate. I would have just called it like a <laughs> gate or something, but... It's a technical name. (laughs) Gotcha. The royal custodians or bailiffs of the Forest of Dean were in possession of the land, and they started the castle after a royal mandate to build one was issued. The sheriff of Gloucester and his sons were overseers of the castle and used it for administrative purposes rather than defense. The Civil War of the Anarchy started in 1138, and it was at this time that Miles de Gloucester, the son of the sheriff, was formally granted St. Brival's Castle by Empress Matilda, who was the daughter of King Henry I and she confirmed him as the Earl of Hereford. And every time I see that, all I can think of is Hereford cattle. (laughs) Miles' son Roger, Fitzmiles, held the castle until the reign of Henry II, and then the king took the castle and rebuilt parts of it. In particular, the wooden keep was rebuilt from stone, because clearly wood is not going to last long. So, One of the reasons the king wanted this castle was because of its location to the forest. This would give him access to an incredible hunting ground. But it was more than that. The forest provided charcoal and iron, and this made the castle a metalworking center. King Henry II alone acquired 1,000 picks, 100 axes, 60,000 nails, and 2,000 shovels from the work done at the castle. King John used the castle extensively as his headquarters for hunting. He had several buildings erected inside the bailey to be used as a lodge. It would also be at this time in the 1200s that the castle would start serving as a prison. Peasants who poached wildlife or did illegal woodcutting would be hit with stiff fines, and when they couldn't pay, it was off to the prison with them. After King John's death, the castle became known for another specialty. So, Kelly, we have finally started binging The Walking Dead. Indeed we have. I know, it's been around for 11, 12 years. We're into the final season, the 11th season. I've watched it here and there when they would do the marathons before Halloween, and the new season would start. So I would get bits and pieces, but I never knew exactly what was going on. I knew who the characters were. So when people were talking about them, I seemed a little bit knowledgeable about some of the stuff. <laughs> so you would you would give your two cents here and there? Yeah. Okay. So I blame Joe Bob Briggs got me started on binging The Walking Dead because this Halloween for his special, he did the first two episodes and he 
interviewed Greg Nicotero, who is a phenom when it comes to makeup and special effects. He's directed a lot of The Walking Dead, executive producer of that. And he also had Jason Blum on from Blumhouse, and they talked about Halloween Kills. So anyway, I got the bug, and I'm like, now I'm going to have to finish this because they have The Walking Dead's first 10 seasons on Netflix. So I've been watching that. You've been hitting it here and there as well. And in watching it, I learned something about crossbows that I never knew before. I always thought that the projectiles, they were called arrows because when it comes to a bow, it's a bow and arrow. Right. So I just assumed on a crossbow, it's an arrow as well. So on one of the earlier episodes, Daryl, who carries the crossbow, was talking about how it shoots bolts. I didn't know that that's what the weapon on there was called, was a bolt. Well, these bolts are actually known as quarrels, and the castle would become a manufacturing hub for quarrel because the crossbow had just become really popular at that time. The more you know. I know. So I thought it was so cool that I'd been watching The Walking Dead and I'd learned that crossbows shoot bolts. So when I was looking here and it said it was a quarrel manufacturing place, I'm like, what's a quarrel? And I looked up quarrel and it said it's a bolt. And I went, I know what that is. (laughs) Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) We're sure when Richard I made this the favored weapon of the land that he had no idea how important the crossbow would become for killing zombies. (laughs) Oh, my (laughs) Make sure you yank that bolt out of the zombie's head to reuse. I know. That's the only thing I thought that was kind of a stupid thing to have because I'm like, you only have so many of those bolts that you can carry. And of course, they're not going to be making any new ones, but he manages to go and retrieve them. So Hugh Dispenser the Younger was placed in charge of the castle in the 1300s. The dispensers brought a harsh rule with them, but Edward II backed them. This would be his downfall because his wife, Isabella of France, deposed him and the dispensers. Isabella was known as the She-Wolf of France, and she hated Hugh Dispenser. Some believe she arranged to have Edward II murdered. She took the castle and held it until her son, Edward III, overthrew her in 1330. This is like a perfect history (laughs) to go ahead and have, you know, like a dynasty type show on TV. The Edwards. (laughs) I hear the music playing in my head now. (laughs) (laughs) So I could just see Isabella as Alexis. The castle would spend the 1400s bouncing between ownership by the Duke of Bedford, the Duke of Warwick, William Herbert, Earl of Warwick, the 16th Countess of Warwick, and finally Thomas Bainham. Then the castle went into decline. Through the 18th and 19th century, there were many changes made with several buildings being knocked down. The keep fell apart. The castle was used after that point as mostly a court and prison. Most of those kept here were debtors until the Debtors Act of 1869. The prison was not a place anyone wanted to be, with no fresh water or firewood or exercise. Most people were here due to very small debts. So basically, if you would look at it as our time, it would be like you owed 20 bucks, but you couldn't pay it. So they were throwing these people into debtors prison for that. Good grief. They only got food if family or friends brought it to them. And the constable charged prisoners a shilling a week for a bed. Oh, my word. (laughs) So not only were you thrown into prison, but you had to pay for your bed and they weren't going to feed you either. You had to hope that you had some family or friends to bring you some. People used to say of the castle that it was, quote, patched and cobbled like a worn out shoe. The prison closed in 1842 and a school was run out of the castle for a time. In 1906, the buildings were renovated so that the castle could be used for habitation. In 1948, St. Brival's Castle became a youth hostel, and it remains so still with nine rooms, two of which are dormitories. The moat was filled and turned into a garden. The solar was named King John's Bedroom in his honor. Inside is a huge fireplace that features notches in the stone. It is said that those were made every time someone was sentenced to death because the room had been a courtroom at one time. A fun tradition is carried on at the castle every Whit Sunday. That is Pentecost for Christians. On that day, locals dress in medieval costumes for St. Brival's bread and cheese dole. A dole claimer would pay a penny to the Earl of Hertford so they could gather firewood from the Hudnall's wood in the past. Today, bread and cheese is blessed by the vicar and then tossed from the wall to the dole claimers to collect. The villagers believe these pieces are imbued with magical properties and good luck. Upturned umbrellas are often used to make the catching easier. Yeah, because who wants bread and cheese that's been on the ground? So here's what I'm envisioning. You couldn't go into the woods and help yourself to anything in there because the monarchy owned it. So you had to pay if you wanted to go get firewood for your home. 
So now instead of them tossing firewood, which, you know, might knock a few people out, they switched it to bread and cheese. I don't know why or what the correlation is between firewood and bread and cheese. But yeah, every Pentecost, they go out there and they throw that off to people and they think, hey, if I get a bunch of it, I'm going to have a bunch of good luck. I don't know if they eat it. You might not have good <laughs> luck if it's been sitting in the sun for a while when you're in the bathroom later. And then there's the ghosts. We did say that this is thought to be one of the most haunted castles in Britain. Many of the rooms have apparitions and strange things hanging around. And I would say, based on my research, every room has something going on. <laughs> Maybe it's the, the apparitions of people that ate that cheese. <laughs> it could be. It's coming back to haunt them. <laughs> the cheese is coming back to haunt you. green haze. <laughs> there have been many times that people have not stayed for the whole night. The castle keep no longer stands, but the area where it once was has a resident spirit. The ghost wears a full suit of armor and usually appears at night. Once people see it, probably glinting in the moonlight, the spirit disappears. The top corridor here has a lady in gray that is often seen gliding up there. So no lady in white, but a lady in gray. The constable's room leaves guests feeling lightheaded. Perhaps it's the phantom smell in here that gets them. I don't know if the cheese has anything to do with it, but it could be. Some guests have had the pleasure of smelling a strong putrid odor that comes on very suddenly. Sound sleep is difficult because the beds will sometimes vibrate, and the door swung open by itself once so violently that it tore the hinges off. Maybe we should call this the exorcist room. All it's missing is the green pea soup flying around the room. Yummy. Now I need to go to Anderson's, get some split pea soup. That's actually really good. I... It's one of my favorite soups. I love peas any way they come. And since we're talking about Britain, one of their specialties is smashed peas, and they are so good. If you go to an English restaurant, order smashed peas. You'll love them. The chaplain's room isn't much better. There are unexplained flashes of light and big orbs that appear in the room. Several dark figures hang out in the room and often block the doorway. The beds sometimes move, and people see indentations on them occasionally, as though a spirit is sitting on them. People have also been touched in this room. The old debtor's prison room has disembodied whispering. There's also a dog growling that is heard, and that is probably from a big black dog that manifests and roams about this part of the castle. So basically, we have our black shuck here. A poltergeist in the room moves the furniture around, and something likes to grab people roughly by the arm. Perhaps an old prison guard trying to lead them somewhere. The porter's lodge is behind the kitchen and has had the odd occurrence of a misty form that hangs around the front of the fireplace. Guests also claim to hear dragging noises. The state apartment is in the oldest part of the castle and features disembodied footsteps and a shadowy entity that walks across the room. Someone also saw the apparition of a little girl dressed in white standing in here. The sounds of loud banging and scratching have also been reported, as well as violin music. I'm like, boy, talk about getting totally different things. <laughs> I was going to say, as one hears when there's banging and scratching. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I don't, well, maybe it's a rap song. I don't know. They're scratching the record and oh, hitting geez. some drums. Oh, and no, get a we're not going to rapping music. again, right? <laughs> the most haunted area is King John's bedroom. Many people who are staying in this room complain about hearing an unseen baby crying. The source of the sound was found one day when a worker was cleaning a chimney. The remains of an infant were found wrapped and tucked away in a niche in the chimney. The baby was thought to have died centuries ago. The remains were given a proper burial. This was related to a bizarre custom we had not heard of before. Apparently, there were some who believed that evil spirits could get into homes through chimneys. Now, we have heard that because that's why we've heard about the witch chimney that's like twisted and stuff so they right. can't get in. Like Gavin and Kathy have. Exactly. But I have never heard of doing this particular thing that you're going to tell everybody in order to keep them from coming in this way. If a baby passed away, the corpse would be put in a special niche of the chimney because it was thought the purity of a baby would keep the evil spirits out. Supposedly, the recess was made specifically for this purpose. I mean, can you imagine making a special niche and, well, we always have at least one baby die at some point. We'll just oh, throw it up grief. in there and it'll keep us all safe from the evil spirits. Okay. Would much rather have a twisty, turny kind of chimney. Yeah. There's a room called the hanging room. This is where those who were sentenced to die were left to await that fate. People often feel as though their throats are closing up in here. This even comes across like a gripping sensation around the throat. The scariest thing in this room is a large black mass. It likes to block people from leaving the room. 
People who try to get past the mass are usually given a sudden violent shove. And remember that haunted college we talked about on an episode where they heard the sound of marbles dropping above them in two different locations? Yes. Well, this room features something that sounds like dropping and rolling marbles. So there's got to be something paranormal about this sound. I don't know what it's related to. There's also muttering, humming, and crashing sounds that also manifest. The guard room is one of the dormitories. It's here that people see the praying woman. She's dressed in peasant's robes that are dirty and tattered. She's called the praying woman because she walks from the doorway to the middle of the room, facing the back window, and kneels down as though in prayer. And then she gets up after a few moments and walks straight out of the window. Prisoners were hanged outside of that window in front of the crowds. Can you imagine? You just get thrown out the window. Here we go. And again, I didn't hear about this prison holding anything other than debtors. So maybe it had other people here that were murderers and such. I'm hoping they weren't hanging people just because they weren't paying their debts, but maybe. Like most castles, this one had an oubliette. Some captives were thrown down here and left to die. The room above this dungeon is called the oubliette room, and a rug conceals the wooden trap door leading to the oubliette. People in this room have felt things tugging at their clothes, and several guests have been awakened when their blankets are yanked off them and thrown across the room. One man reported being pinned to his bed by something he couldn't see. I don't know if this is sleep paralysis that he was experiencing or something else. Chris Andrews, a manager at the castle, told Spooky Isles that he was doing his final checks one night around five in the evening. It was dark outside already. He could see the curtains swaying dramatically as though a strong wind was blowing. But there was no open door or window and no breeze coming from anywhere. When he went near the curtains, he felt something brush by his arm. He also heard the latch on a door rattle five times in a row when no one else was in the castle. Castles always have a creepy vibe to them. St. Brival's Castle has more than just a vibe to it. There seems to be a lot of activity going on here, and a lot of it seems to be rather negative. You hear a lot of the black mass being grabbed. One night in this hostel may be all a guest can take. Is St. Brival's Castle haunted? That That is is for you to decide. decide. Wow, how many castles have we done on this podcast? A lot of them. Seems like they're like prisons and asylums. Every one of them's got a ghost. We need to get to one. (laughs) Yeah, if you can get me on a plane. (laughs) (laughs) We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We heard back from Tammy after doing the Ramsey House on our last episode, Kelly. And she hadn't told me when she suggested it that when she was inside that house that she'd had her hair tugged at one time. Oh, wow. And apparently this is something that little Billy likes to do. Well, there you go. What I want to know is how does he get up there? Because he was, I think, eight years old, if I recall. So he's pulling. I mean, Tammy's not short. I, I'd say she's about your height. Yeah, you she's. I think she's a little bit shorter than me, but he was eight years old. I know she's so taller than me. W- most people are. It wouldn't be that hard for him to reach up to tug her hair. <laughs> I guess. Or if he jumped, he could get a good yank. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Give him Billy ideas. And we heard from Carrie. She said, so I've been the first and only resident in my house built in 2007. My first husband lived there almost three years before he left and we divorced. Four years later, my new husband moved in. Over the years, we've had seven kids living in the house, so it's rarely been empty. My husband swears when he first moved in that my house was haunted. He said it was the noisiest house he has ever slept in. Walking, creaking, door shutting, etc., I honestly ignored him, saying that it's just the kids or his imagination with a large house settling. But recently, I've been in the house completely alone. Our little dog goes to the stairs, and I hear footsteps upstairs. The sound comes from near the master bedroom windows. Not near anything like the AC or bathrooms or plumbing. Door shutting I blame on AC or kids, but again, I heard one upstairs, and no one was home, and there was no AC on. When I mentioned to my husband, he said, See? See, I told you. Well, it's not hurting me or anyone, and I guess I'm never home alone now. Any thoughts as to who or why in a newer home? I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know if you could determine that. If there are some articles, some furniture, anything brought in could have an attachment. Yeah, I mean, we always rest back on our laurels when we're in these brand new homes, like ours is a new build. We're the first people to live here. Oh, nothing bad could happen here because... We're the first house that's ever been here, and we're the only people. The thing is, what do we do on nearly every episode of History Goes Bump? We go back to the land. 
what was on the land before? Was there something else built here? Who lived here? What happened on the land? We don't know. There could have been a battle here that we have no idea about. Maybe there was a couple of Native American tribes that had it out here or some other battle, especially here on the East Coast. There's all kinds of stuff that was going on or settlers fighting with each other or true crime. Look at how much true crime we have today that we talk about. Well, if we think that this is new in our era, they were doing it back then, too. So that's true. We have no idea what's happened. So that's always what I tell people is even if you're in a new home, you could have something that has happened on the land and it's just in the house now. Absolutely. And it could be a situation where you brought something into the home with some sort of haunted object or someplace that you've been there was an attachment it's really hard to determine (laughs) sure maybe you brought home a hitchhiking ghost (laughs) could be so there's lots of reasons why it could be going on and i mean if it's not hurting anybody like she said well i guess i'm never home alone (laughs) this is true as this episode goes out we're getting ready to have uh, new year's eve and new year's day so we want to wish everybody a healthy and happy New Year's, and hopefully you have a blessed and healthy 2022. Amen. We want to thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode is brought to you by our executive producers. Join me in the cemetery by becoming an executive producer. You can join on Patreon or PayPal. Check out the Support the Show tab on the website for more information. Hopefully I say this right. Hopefully I say this right. You say this white? You say it white. I'm going to say it right. (laughs) (laughs) Is it brivels or brevelles? Or brevelles. (laughs) Brevelles. We could say it all different kinds of ways. Brevelles. (laughs) Brevelles. If I was to say it the way I would phonetically, it would have been (laughs) brivels. Brivels. I'm going to (laughs) St. (laughs) Brivels. St. Brival's Castle dates back to 1017. Nope. <laughs> 1017, 1075. Not a real big difference there. Oh, happy Christmas Eve all. Major disputes had forced the association to set, to set down. Set, the I'm association set that to down. set down operation. The Wanderers. I'm a wanderer. A wanderer. I go round and round and round and round. And round. <laughs> you know what? That's what? a great song for hockey because they pretty much go around, 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 around the ice. The Wanderers and Arenas played the very first game under the NA. NA. So it's called a Mott and Bailey design. Gotcha. Like Mutt and Jeff. No, it's not like Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> And this made the castle a metal wookie. Metal wookie? It's a wookie. It's, it's a, a wookie. It's a, We've it's got a metal wookie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do. I can't. I can't speak wookie. <laughs> Peasants who poached wildlife or did illegal woodcutting would be hit with stiff fines. And when they couldn't pay, it was off to the prison with them. Off with their heads. Oh, not quite that. <laughs> Good grief. Inside is a huge fireplace that features notcher notchers. There's notchers in the stone. I want some nachos now. 